Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again, and... Say... It's Miller time! Welcome to Miller Time, which while normally chronicles the deterioration of Frank Miller's output over the years, we now have two Miller Times in a row where people apparently decided, wait, can we actually see some evidence that this guy once upon a time produced good stuff? And that is most definitely the case here. For over 30 years, The Dark Knight Returns has been celebrated as one of the best Batman stories ever made. For the longest time, it was, inaccurately, credited for returning Batman to being a figure of dark, serious storytelling after the one-two punch of the Silver Age and the Adam West Batman series. Though, of course, as people rightfully have pointed out nowadays, no, that would be Dennis O'Neill and Neil Adams throughout the 70s. Both Tim Burton and Zack Snyder drew heavy inspiration from this kind for their films, Snyder especially, and I've often joked that DC only seems to ever remember its printed two things, Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, since they always seem to fall back on the lessons of dark and serious story equals good slash profitable story. However, the book has also undergone a lot of critical reevaluation over the years, especially in light of Frank Miller's other works, the ones that lean in a more fascist direction, that prop up single violent figures as being the only ones who can solve all the problems, and everyone else is inept or corrupt. Do I agree? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. It's hard not to see that just because we've now lived through Holy Terror, Sin City, All-Star Batman and Robin, the sequels to The Dark Knight Returns, and other works which were really more leaning in that direction. At the same time, though, this is a story about Batman returning to crime fighting. He's the main character, and he's supposed to be right in the end, outwitting or outfighting the bad guys. Still, the devil's in the details, and much smarter people than me have read into it and done brilliant work deconstructing this stuff. It's different for me to have to do a deep dive like that into this than, say, Secret Empire, because the creators behind that explicitly were trying to speak to the rise of fascism in American culture and an openly fascist government with Stevel and Hydra. And I admit it, sometimes I'm good at picking up subtext, and sometimes the text can slam a big mallet on my head that says the point, and I'll still not see it. It's a failing of mine. And hey, even if I don't pick up that kind of subtext, it is still important to look back at it 35 years later and see if it holds up on its own and whether it's worth revisiting so much, or if we need to just let it go like so many other dated books and concepts. Anyway, let's talk a bit of history here. According to an introduction to the book made for the 10th anniversary edition, which is where I'm getting the scans for this, Miller was brought on to do a Batman book because the sales of the main title were flat and they wanted a major, high-profile relaunch of the series. And I guess an unrelated prestige format many series out of continuity with the main book was exactly that. Miller says in the introduction that one of the main inspirations was the fact that he was turning 30 and realized that he would be older than Batman's in-universe age. Thus, he wanted to write a story where Batman was much older. Some men get sports cars when they turn middle-aged. Others write stories where their childhood heroes are old men. We all cope how we can. To be more exact, he wanted to look at Batman's Last Case. There's an interesting bit from the introduction that's a bit eyebrow-raising, and the latter half kind of explains a lot of Miller's writing when it comes to Batman. He's neither petty nor petulant. Damn it, Alfred! Dick gave me a VHS tape full of rock concert footage for my birthday! Is he still mad about his dinner of rats? He's no whiner. There's not a trace of self-pity in his soul. I get what he was probably trying to say, but that sounds more like a person who lacks self-reflection or awareness for the harm that can be caused by his actions. The next bit is, admittedly better, that Batman's passions are grand and his triumphs are Olympian, contrasted with all the ridiculous goofiness of his history, like 50-foot pennies and giant signal lights in the sky to summon him. Although personally, I would not describe Batman's unhappiness as not depressing, but brooding, Wagnerian torment, which comes across more to me as, CHECK OUT MY EPIC MAN PAIN! IT'S MORE IMPORTANT THAN ANY DEPRESSION YOU HAVE! I AM THE KNIGHT, AND THAT MAKES ME SAD! There's a bit more behind the scenes to get into as we go on, but this is gonna be a long review, so we should probably get things going. So let's dig into The Dark Knight Returns and see how it looks this many years later. Welcome to a 
thing to note is that the book was not originally called The Dark Knight Returns. That was just the title of the first issue, with the entire story just called The Dark Knight. Obviously, that changed upon future releases, and really it's a great title for it given that's the one-sentence summary of this story. And yeah, no looking at the covers since we've got a lot to look at, save for what has become the iconic image and cover for the book. Batman's silhouette as he leaps through the air with the lightning strike behind him. Few people seem to mention the pose he's making, though. Alfred! I've invented dabbing! Most of the book is arranged in mostly 16-panel presentation, wherein we've got four rows of four small panels. It's almost like a comic strip at times, and works well for bits like this where we don't need to see the big picture, just close-ups that get the idea across. Basically, the pages are almost always arranged to fit in with this 16-panel grid and not moving outside the confines of the rectangular space. In this case, Bruce Wayne is in the middle of some high-speed car race and, this being a work of fiction, the car crashes and explodes, but Bruce managed to bail out at the last second. And upon close-up, we can see that Bruce is now sporting a big, bushy mustache. Does make sense that he'd shave that as Batman. Kind of ruins the mystique of a dark figure of the night when you could very well just be Mike Downey accounting and data entry expert. A big part of the book is the Talking Heads news segments we see in these opening pages. They provide commentary on the events and satirize the then-growing news segments like this at the time. Honestly, this idea of pundits debating things in purported news segments has only become more relevant as time goes on, although in turn it makes it just as frustrating reading it nowadays. We get some exposition here. Gotham is facing a massive heat wave that, in turn, is causing a crime wave. I did quickly Google this, and yes, apparently there is a potential link between warmer weather and an increase in violent crime, though I couldn't tell you why. If I'm sweating my ass off with a high humidity and 97 degrees out, the last thing I want to do is anything strenuous. Is Gotham's problem this whole time just that it needs pools? In addition, Commissioner Gordon is going to be retiring within a month and is trying to bring down a criminal gang known as the Mutants, whose most recent crime is murdering some nuns. It's also been 10 years since anyone last saw Batman. Our younger viewers will not remember the Batman. A recent survey shows that most high schoolers consider him a myth. This opinion changed when he started a TikTok. But real he was. Especially that time he fought Xenomorphs. That was the realest of all. Even today, debate continues on the right and wrong of his one-man war on crime. And you are going to see that played out throughout this series. Later, Bruce is meeting with Gordon, who now knows that he was Batman, and they wax nostalgic about how Bruce used to hide it from him. Spoken to Dick lately? Not for seven years, Jim, you know that. I just hope he doesn't get mutated into some kind of weird shape-shifting Joker thing in a few years. Because that would be dumb. Gordon also hints that something happened to Jason Todd, and it should be noted that this was before Jason Todd was killed by the Joker in the main continuity, the implication being that it was Jason's death that finally got Bruce to give up being Batman. After their drinks, Bruce walks the streets of Gotham, feeling like the whole place has given up and he's just been a zombie walking through the city for ten years. He makes his way to Crime Alley, thinking about how every time he hears a police siren, he forgets that he gave it all up, and if it was revenge that Batman was after, he's taken it after forty years. Bruce's narration talks about Batman like he's another person, some force inside him that's trying to remind him of what he was. Two members of the mutants suddenly confront Bruce to mug him as the voice of Batman eggs Bruce on, reminding him that this isn't so different a situation as to when his parents died, and he could take out his aggression here and now. However, the mutants decide, nah, this dude seems way too into the idea of fighting back, and 
can't do murders when they're into it. Is that a regular occurrence for them? Oh man, I wanted to do a murder, but you made it weird, dude. You made it weird. Bruce reflects that criminals have changed since he started. The man who killed his parents was just after money, but this breed is out there strictly for the killing. Meanwhile, at the Arkham Home for the Emotionally Troubled... Yeah, remember back in Heroes in Crisis when I mentioned media routinely vilifying or making fun of psychology and psychiatry? Dark Knight Returns is a big example of that. A lot of it during this time was a response to pop psychology, actual bullcrap spouted by people who claimed to know what they were talking about and thus became celebrities, self-help gurus, advice columnists, etc. The problem is that instead of recognizing, hey, these are just con artists or morons, they convinced a lot of people that all of mental health professionals don't know what they're talking about. And thus here's Frank Miller putting his oh-so-subtle stamp on it by having Arkham, a place for the deranged, now turned into a place for bleeding hearts who think they can cure pure evil and all that bullcrap. The Joker is there, but he's actually not really any trouble since without Batman, he's just become quasi-catatonic. Harvey Dent, in the meantime, has had facial reconstruction surgery, not the first time that's happened in the Batman books, and the doctors claim that they've cured his psychological issues as Two-Face. And thus we have this minor character, Dr. Bartholomew Walper. While Nobel Prize-winning plastic surgeon Dr. Herbert Willing dedicated himself to restoring the face of Harvey Dent. Of course! That's what brings Batman out of retirement, the return of one face! Gordon is skeptical, though even Bruce says in a public statement that he funded the treatment and supports what has happened. The commissioner is an excellent cop, but I think a poor judge of character. We must believe in Harvey Dent. Ooh, someone should make that a campaign slogan for him or something. We must believe that our private demons can be defeated. Especially if those demons are telling you to dress up like a bat and fight crime. Not that I know anything about that! I'm not Batman! Bruce has a nightmare recalling the time when he fell into a cave and was confronted by bats, including the image of a giant one. Surely the fiercest survivor, the purest warrior. Behold! The purest warrior! That night, he visits the Batcave, and we get to see what would become an iconic image once he did die. Jason's costume in a tube. Ironically, Miller himself in 1991 would call the killing of Jason Todd the ugliest and most cynical thing he'd ever seen in comics. And he'd most certainly know those things! Alfred finds him in the cave and suggests he go back to bed. Master Bruce, whatever happened to your mustache? Alfred! It's escaped! After Harvey Dent, wrapped up in bandages, recruits all his old gang for a job, Bruce retires for the evening and, of course, the Mark of Zorro is on TV and it triggers his PTSD regarding his parents' death, in probably what's now THE iconic sequence depicting it. Again, the 16-panel format here really works best for this as we slowly see the events unfold, ending with the pearl necklace getting snapped. Funny thing in case you didn't know, the pearls shouldn't drop individually to the ground like they do in a lot of media. Pearl necklaces have knots in between each pearl to keep them from scraping against each other and causing wear and tear. This only really makes sense if they're either fake pearls or a really cheap pearl necklace. Either way, the Waynes were cheapskates. Bruce tries to calm himself by flipping channels, but all he sees are news reports of crime and death. A bat, just like the one in his dream, flying into the window. A thunderstorm hits the city and knocks out power, and we soon see a succession of scenes of criminals getting their asses kicked by a dark figure. Lightning flashing in the sky. It's honest to God cinematic in its presentation. What the hell happened to this Frank Miller? People can talk all they want about how the problem nowadays is artists don't know how to color his work, but he just stopped being able to tell stories artistically like this. One of the places our hero hits is an arcade, where a young girl named Carrie Kelly is almost stabbed by the mutants until the mutant gets four batarangs embedded in his arm. Nice grouping, Bruce. Didn't even make him bleed or anything. As the news reports on Batman's sudden return, we finally get a shot of him in the classic costume. This should be agony. I should be a mass of aching muscle. Broken. Spent. 
unable to move. Were I an older man, I surely would. My God, Frank is even placing the correct emphasis on words during this era. This is what I mean when I say the quality of his work has gone down even without getting into his racism and other garbage. He just used to be able to not be a parody of himself. I mean, that being said, Miller's artwork can be an... acquired taste. What the hell is up with your head, Bats? And possibly another instance of social critique, a young rookie cop wants to bring in Batman after he takes out some bank robbers, but his older partner is just in admiration of him. It's also possible it's just meant as an audience surrogate kind of thing, but it's not like Batman has actually gone anywhere. They didn't stop publishing the book or anything. But anyway, Bruce finds a scarred coin in the bank robber's pocket. Two-Face's calling card here. At Arkham, the TV set is showing a debate about Batman's return, with the pro-Batman side of Lana Lang depicting him as some populist hero, while the one we're supposed to hate rightfully points out his excessive force and calls him a fascist without any real rebuttal to that. And of course, the Joker watches this and finally begins moving again, grinning and talking now that Bats is back. The mutant leader releases a videotaped message about Gordon and Batman. Frank Miller says he based the mutant leader's speech patterns on Mr. T in the 30th anniversary edition. He doesn't say why outright, but he says it while in conversation with Brian Azzarello, who infers that it's because of Mr. T's popularity, likening it to Clubber Lang inflicting so much punishment on Rocky, just like the mutant leader will to Batman later. Let's see how that works out. We will kill the old man Gordon. His women will weep for him. We will chop him. We will grind him. We will bathe in his blood. I myself will kill the fool Batman. I will rip the meat from his bones and suck him dry. I will eat his heart and drag his body through the street. You know, you got a lot of mouth, and I got a lot of fists for your mouth. Yeah, I don't hear it, but hey, that's a thing, I guess. Batman interrogates the goon he had earlier beat up, and beat up again here, lamenting the fact that, shock, even criminals have rights. As a big symbol for the return of bats, Gordon lights up the bat signal, which is spotted by the young Carrie Kelly, whose parents get high and complain about Batman being a fascist. Yeah, this is totally a real debate we're seeing. Frank Miller doesn't have any opinions about anything. What do you think, Garth Marenghi? I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. Later, Two-Face makes his move, trying to hold a news tower ransom. Batman intercepts, having deduced where he was planning on attacking, and even gets shot square in the logo. Why do you think I wear a target on my chest? Can't armor my head. Although, considering how fast the ground is approaching, I kind of wish I could. That line is actually kind of hilarious given what happens at the end of this book. He manages to tackle Two-Face into a building, where he takes off the bandages and reveals... his face is still repaired. However, as Batman narrates, the scars run too deep. He sees Harvey as he truly is, the more monstrous face now united. For Batman, he sees a reflection, the monstrous bat from his nightmare just being who he is deep inside ending the first part. Book two is The Dark Knight Triumphant, which starts out with Gordon needing to kill a teenage member of the mutants gang who tried to assassinate him. Later, the book will say this is the third such attempt on his life. Yeah, this book has a lot of okay boomer energy to it, especially when it comes to cops and treating the killing of criminals, even teenage criminals, as something we should be cheering. There is, of course, a difference between self-defense in a work of fiction versus the real-life horrors of innocents killed by the police, but it's uncomfortable to say the least. I already don't agree with the can't we just have escapist fiction without politics thing because all art is political, but you can't even pretend like that about this book. It's heavily political. Unless someone wants to pretend that pundits arguing over vigilantism, civil rights, and psychoanalyzing people, or the usage of Superman as a pawn of the US government later, aren't political. And if you don't think they are, I'm really curious what the hell your definition of politics is! Anywho, one aspect this second issue addresses is how Batman's return is inspiring people to start fighting crime themselves. Some just to defend others from criminals, while others are dressing up in costumes. And of particular note is Carrie Kelly, who has assembled her own Robin costume. Carrie Kelly came about because of John Byrne, who was on a plane with Frank Miller as he was writing the book. He originally wasn't planning on including Robin in the story, but loved the image in his head of a tiny, colorful figure contrasted 
pitted against a massive gray and black Batman. Byrne insisted that Robin be a girl, taking particular inspiration from a drawing by Love and Rockets co-creator Jaime Hernandez. Carrie is one of the best parts of the story, that youthful energy that really pops off the page since the colors are that much brighter when the rest of the book uses a lot of grays and washed out coloring. That being said, in my humble opinion, Carrie is underdeveloped. She does stuff in the book, she's an integral part of the story at various points, but she lacks a lot of characterization of her own beyond being brave and obedient to Batman. We get one moment later of her being in awe of Jason Todd's costume in the Batcave, but we're never privy to her thoughts or where she agrees or disagrees with Bruce. It's another reason why I'm so annoyed that Dark Knight 3 wasn't focused on her becoming Batman. I feel like we got more characterization and development in that one Batman the Animated Series episode that only homages The Dark Knight Returns than we got in the actual story. She's just there to enhance Bruce's arc. We head into a sequence that's controversial partially because of poor artwork. Some of the mutants have kidnapped a little kid and are holding him for ransom. Batman comes in and knocks out two of the goons. One holds the kid with a gun to his head, so Batman picks up the massive frickin' gun and shoots at the mutant, who lets the kid go. The controversy comes from whether or not he killed that guy. Zack Snyder even said that in his inspiration for Batman v Superman, he was all in for a Batman who killed people all the time in this story. And yeah, the artwork really seems to imply that. Problem is, the rest of the book doesn't support that. When the cops do finally issue an arrest warrant for Batman, murder is not listed in the charges. Until a later death, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. And Batman repeatedly throughout the story says that killing is a line he cannot, will not cross, and tries to take great pains to not do so. During a later fight with the mutants, they end up killing themselves more when their weaponry bounces off of his armored Batmobile and goes back at them. A callous disregard for lives lost? Yes. Willing to use guns, as we see with him apparently shooting the mutant in the shoulder or something? Yes. Being way, way more violent than normal? Most certainly yes. But Batman in this story does not try to kill anyone. Frank Miller just didn't draw the last panel very well. Then again, it is possible he just didn't realize he killed that guy. What happened to no guns? This is a gun? Then some more punditry where Dr. Walper blames all the recent issues with society on the media being complicit in shaping the narrative of Batman as a force for good. Lana Lang, in turn, ignores the question of civil rights and due process in favor of, again, the populist hero inspiring us to glory and crap. A minor bit that doesn't really go anywhere, other than more political commentary, in this case against the insurance industry and the military, is the revelation that a general sold off military-grade weapons to the mutants to get money for his ailing wife. All it leads to is Batman realizing that the mutants plan to wage actual war against Gotham. Thus, he decides to stop them as they start gathering in the city dump. Batman goes to deal with them once and for all in his new souped-up tank mobile, while the mayor finally announces their new appointment for commissioner, Captain Ellen Yindel, who says that her first act will be put out an arrest warrant for Batman for assault, breaking and entering, and creating a public hazard. Wait, not even assault with a deadly weapon? Or do they not realize I shot that guy and that's why I'm not up for murder charges? At the dump, the mutant leader declares that they'll storm the city, police headquarters in particular, and just kill everyone in their path. Naturally, Batman objects to this and warns them to surrender. The Batmobile. That's what you called it, dick. Kinda name a kid would come up with. It was totally dick's stupid idea, not mine! I would never come up with something so stupid for it! Just imagine if, like, a 12-year-old made fun of it or something. As I said, Batman himself is actually doing less damage to the mutants with his rubber bullets than they are to themselves with their bazookas and grenade launchers. And rubber bullets are already an asshole, potentially deadly thing to use. Carrie is nearby watching all this, the mutant leader demanding that Batman come out and fight him, or else he's a coward. I feel the empty seat beside me, and once again I think of you, dick. I look at the one creature who isn't wounded or hiding. We never faced anything like this. We only fought humans. Ah yes, some muscly asshole with sharp teeth who apparently talks like Mr. T. Truly an enemy that Batman has never seen the like. 
And again with the gun thing. Batman is tempted to just blow him away, end this evil that we never dreamed of. Darkseid is sitting on a couch somewhere watching this and being like, Really? This is all that was needed to intimidate you people? Wow, I've been trying too hard. But yeah, he reiterates that killing him would be crossing a line that he refuses to. As such, he decides to indeed go out and try to fight him, even knowing that he's going up against a guy much younger and in his prime. It could be argued that doing this is incredibly stupid, but as will be shown later, there is a reason why you do this. Just knocking him out with the weapons of the tank mobile will just make him a martyr or still be able to organize the mutants from a jail cell. Defeating him in single combat like this is an important psychological warfare component to bringing down the mutants. And so he exits and <laughs> Oh man, Frank gave this a whole splash page. He's all hunched over like this and moving his legs up. It's like he's Bugs Bunny sneaking up by going from one bush to another while xylophone music plays. But yeah, the fight. It's intense and violent, and while Batman gets some hits off, the mutant leader kicks the crap out of him. In another interesting, and ironic in hindsight, twist, the mutant leader starts beating Batman with a crowbar, but Robin saves him from said beating, managing to distract the mutant leader long enough for him to pull out something from his utility belt and knock the leader out. Kerry gets him back to the tank mobile and comes with him to get him to safety. Meanwhile, at the White House, President Reagan, at least I presume it's Reagan given his speech patterns and what year this came out, we don't see his face, meets with Superman. Reagan says that while he appreciates what Batman's doing, he's causing a bit of a ruckus and needs to calm down a bit, so he asks Supes to talk to him. I do it myself, but the damn Congress decided that Reagan's raiders needed to retire too to set an example. While Batman recovers in the cave, formally meeting Carrie and calling her Robin officially, Dr. Walper talks about letting the Joker have some screen time on TV. The dialogue seems to make it clear that while Walper believes in what he's selling, he's also interested in good PR for himself. Again, that idea that mental health professionals care more about making money and good press than anything else. Also, the mutants declare that they'll come for their leader, and those in custody, and will kill and destroy and pillage and etc. The mayor claims that Gordon has bungled all this by putting his trust in Batman, and decides to personally sit down and negotiate with the mutant leader. Because, you know, when someone makes loud statements about killing and eating the flesh off the bones of officials, you tell yourself, sure, this is someone I can and want to reason with. Yeah, it goes about as well as one would expect. The mutant leader rips the mayor's throat out with his teeth. As Bruce recovers, he informs Alfred of how serious he is for Carrie to be his Robin, Alfred even bringing up Jason's death to try to deter him. I will never forget Jason. He was a good soldier. He honored me. But the war goes on. This is a recurring thing that always makes me grind my teeth, and it feels like Miller in particular popularized it. Describing his partners as soldiers. And it's fascinating because it's right in the damn title. Batman is not a soldier. He's a knight. I frequently liken superheroes to knight errants, figures of literature who go out into the world to battle evil and are motivated by higher ideals. Sure, in actual practice, knights like this were kind of assholes and bullies, and Don Quixote was more an example of someone deluding themselves about it, but the idea is there. Despite the one-man war on crime thing, they're not actually fighting a war. They're just trying to help. They believe in something greater than themselves, an ethical code that they live by to protect the innocent from injustice. They are not meant to fight wars. Batman does not wage war. He writes wrong so that an eight-year-old will never lose their parents the way he did his. And for those he's failed, he tries to inspire them to the same ideals. They're not soldiers any more than Superman is. Losing Jason Todd was one of the most painful things that ever happened to Bruce, something that in both this and the main mainstream universe caused him to question whether he was doing the right thing. Whether his ideals meant nothing other than more children losing their lives. Jason honored you? While you stand in the presence of the monument to him? 
That doesn't sound like he lived up to my ideals. It sounds like he sacrificed himself for my cause, which is more important than his life. I don't know, maybe I'm just reading into things too much, but then again, it was this version of Batman that ended up being so influential to others down the line, including the several years and iterations of jerk-ass Batman who pushed people away, distrusted his friends, and seemed to have little regard for people's lives and rights, even if he wasn't going to kill them. Anyway, the advantage that Carrie Kelly has for Batman is that she's a youth in this society and understands how the mutants talk and can infiltrate them. I mean, I suppose Batman could try to do it, but it'd probably be just him in the bat suit and the weird Cyclops glasses going, How do you do, fellow kids? Anyway, we get two scenes interspersed with each other. Carrie spreading word to the mutants that they all need to gather in a pipe that flows into the West River and Commissioner Yindel speaking with Gordon about Batman. She doesn't understand why a man like him could support a vigilante, and he responds with a metaphor about Pearl Harbor, like he was there, which, yeah, he's supposed to be pretty damn old at this point, so it'd follow. That there's a conspiracy theory about it that Roosevelt knew the attack on Pearl Harbor was coming and deliberately let it happen so America could enter the war. Gordon admits that's horrible if it was true, and yet it's what got America to join the war against the Nazis. A lot of innocent men died, but we won the war. It bounced back and forth in my head until I realized I couldn't judge it. It was too big. The point seems to be that sometimes you need to compromise your ethics a little bit for the sake of a greater good. And maybe we shouldn't judge those who need to make hard choices like that when we're incapable of making a decision like that. Which, yeah, it, it's a hard choice and a hard thing. But maybe they should still be held accountable for it regardless. I mean, I can think of other examples in fiction where someone did something wrong that ultimately led to good, but they still were held accountable for their actions. Sometimes the ends don't justify the means, they simply allow us to understand why the means were used. And we shouldn't necessarily give a pass to it, since some will do horrible things in the name of a greater good. But that won't necessarily outweigh the evil they've done. Anyway, Batman speaks to Gordon and instructs him to let the mutants gather at the pipe, and to let the mutant leader go to it as well. There are too many of the mutants to be arrested, they need to be demotivated, humiliated, actually defeated. As such, it's time for a rematch. And thus the mutant leader is let out, Batman bringing him through the waste pipe and into the muddy river. In an ironic twist, it turns out the mutant leader was Andy Dufresne. The two fall into the mud and fight again. Bruce realized, of course, that trying to fight the mutant leader in a fair fight was not going to go for him. Thus he's evening the odds by forcing him to fight in the thigh-deep mud, attack his eyes, fight smarter by going for nerve clusters to disable them, and basically force him down until he's in the mud and unable to fight. You don't get it, boy. This isn't a mud hole. It's an operating table. And I'm the surgeon! Let's face it, it's just not that tough to float to the top of the surgical toilet. So yeah, with the mutant leader defeated, all the mutants decide to paint their faces up with the logo and declare themselves the Sons of the Batman, now working for him and saying they will wage war on criminals. Gordon retires, though thinks that Batman is finished after this. He broke and bent the rules for him so much over the years that it's likely he won't be able to beat the cops now. 